will move into our speaker portion, and our speaker today is John, so I will turn it right over you to you. Thank you for presenting and joining us today. John Brian Horst, work for Gardner Financial Services. With Mike, I'll kind of get into my work history, a little bit about me, and some basic information on you know uh, retirement accounts, financial planning, that sort of thing. Nothing too too serious. So about me, <clears throat> graduated in high school from New Craig, Minnesota. Uh, fun fact about that picture is uh, freshman year of high school, I was shorter than both of those guys. So pretty proud of that. Uh, then I went to Hamlin University, double major in uh, economics and management, played tennis. Uh, as you can see, you can't quite see my hair, but it was really flowing. It was really <laughs> great back then, I had to wear a hat to keep it out of my eyes. Uh, I'm sure you all remember the, the 2006 Hamlin tennis season where we had a great season and finished third in conference. I'm sure you all saw that <laughs> back in time. Yeah. Also about me, married Hillary in 2017 and baby do in March of 2020. Oh, cool. Congrats. Yeah, that's an actual picture. <laughs> Sucking the thumb and everything. Yeah, we don't know if boy or girl, we're not going to find out, so we're going to wait. Also, a fun fact about that picture is the my favorite part about that picture. Besides, it's a great picture. Uh, the photographer's assistant is actually behind us with a light shooting it up so you can't see her, but I thought that was pretty neat. My work history, I got it all up there. So I started back at the New Prague Community Pool back in middle school and high school. The maintenance front desk lifeguard swimming, swimming instructor, manager. Was there for eight summers, actually, from middle school through college. Loved it. It was uh, Wells Fargo, and then I finally decided I needed a, a real sort of internship to get out my resume. So I went to, uh, got an internship at Wells Fargo Share Owner Services. I believe now it's EQ Share Owner Services. And basically what they do, uh, it's like stock certificates. They were kind of the ones that physically printed and, and would send out the stock certificates uh, to, to shareholders. And actually they they were, when I was there, they were in charge of the, the Green Bay Packers stock certificates. Ooh. So people would always be sending in the stock shares and they'd say like, bears suck or vikings ah. suck. And of course we're all Minnesotans, so we're just kind of chuckling uh, at that. But it was, it was kind of a neat experience, actually. As an intern, most of my time was spent in the mailroom helping them out, but you know, they had some projects for me as well, so it was good. Uh, next, I went to another internship. I was a research assistant at the, the Minnesota House of Representatives Research Department, which was pretty neat. Uh, I got to do that for a few months. I worked mainly with uh, the guy who was in charge of like K through 12 education. So he had just spreadsheets upon spreadsheets of like all the school districts, and he was the if legislators needed information on, on on programs for the schools. They would come to him, and he would you know create graphs for them and do all that kind of stuff so it's actually a really neat uh, experience to see how that that worked and they had researchers you know for all the different you know, mortgages or whatever product you you could assume there would be legislation for it that they had a researcher for it so it was really neat it was kind of interesting because he would tell stories he'd be like yeah this this legislator came to me and they want these two variables on a graph to show some sort of correlation he's like they have no correlation with each other but unfortunately that's not my job my job is just to give them the information and then they use it for for whatever they need to so it's kind of an interesting you know learning experience that way too so then i finally got my first real job uh, after graduation full-time job i started uh, Sandbold and Associates, basically, they worked for Prudential, so it was like three or four different financial advisors. I was kind of their assistant, so I was working my way there. Um, I started in, on October 1st, 2007, and if any of you recall, uh, I believe October 3rd, 2007 was basically the peak, and then it was all the way down for the next year, year and a half, so trial by fire. Uh, it, was, it was pretty an interesting time to be in financial services, and I was just the assistant at the time. You know, I didn't have to... They weren't, I wasn't a financial advisor, but still, you're talking to people every day when you know, the stock market's doing that. You learn a lot and in a short period of time, especially with my first job out of, out of college, so it's pretty interesting there. So the Series 6 and 63, that, these are financial, various financial licenses that you need to pick up to, to get into the industry. The, the 6 allows you to give recommendations or discuss mutual funds and variable annuities and variable life insurance. So that was what they primarily uh, dealt with, so that was what I had to get. So that was, those were the licenses I got when I was there. I was there for about five years. Then I went to Wealth Enhancement Group. Um, it's kind of a similar thing. I was a client service manager. Uh, 
mainly customer service, and then that Series 7 and 65 just allows you to do basically everything else as far as investment <coughs> products are concerned, individual stocks, REITs, uh, all that kind of stuff, all everything else. So I got that license because that was what they required there. I was there for about three years. And then I went to UBS uh, Financial Services, um, again, mainly client services, but then I started to get into a little bit more financial planning. So I was able to sit in on client appointments and start help preparing their financial plans. We have some computer software that we use, so we would go through uh, various financial plans, and that was when I got uh, the, C the CFP Certified Financial Planner. You can see the little the little R R ball after that, and then in my email, they, I had to do it all caps. And there was a TM after that. They're very particular. The the financial the, the CFP board is very particular about how you use their marks. So they actually on on their test, uh, no jokes. You have to take a big test to, to become a CFP, and part of that test is actually what seven words can be after you say CFP. There has to be a word that you have like a, if the CFP exam, the CFP. Practitioner, I don't remember them all because it's kind of worthless. You can always look it up, but it, I always I like to make fun of them. But they're they're a good organization, uh, but but they're very particular in how they use how they use their marks. So that's why it says CFP professional instead of just CFP, which is certified financial planner. And I'll get into a little bit more detail what that means in, in, in a second. And then uh, so now I work with uh, so I was there for about three years, and then. Uh, Mike had the opportunity to come work with him here in Prescott. I was driving to Bloomington every day from here, um, so that was about two hours in the car every day. And Mike said, well, why don't you come work with me in Prescott? And I jumped at the chance. Now, I've been working with Mike since about last, last June, it was June of 2018. So, what is a CFP uh, professional? As, as I have to say, uh, it's basically a formal recognition of expertise in the areas of financial planning, taxes, insurance, estate planning, investment, and retirement. I can't say that I'm a, an expert, maybe, in all of these fields, but it gives you a, a good, broad, basic knowledge uh, that you can use. That you, you know, if you, you we, we talk to a lot of people's tax preparers or CPAs if we need to, because we have to run ideas by them and make sure that what we have is accurate. Uh, the information that we have, if there's recommendations we have, say, well. You know, we think that the tax law is this way, but if we want to confirm, we should probably talk to your, your tax person, so we'll reach out to them. Same thing with like estate planning. We don't we don't write wills or, or trusts or anything like that, but we, we can work with the lawyer to say this is what their the client may be looking for. How do you legally need to do that in, in, in your area? And then we'll work with them. As far as how what what does it take to, to get the CFP, it's just like a class. So it's usually you can do it in one or two years, depending on how fast you want to do it. There's I think seven <laughs> courses that you have to take. Uh, you can do it online or, or in person, and then you have to take the exam. Um, it's just a, you know the, it's a six hour test. You have three hours in the morning, eat lunch, you come back three hours in that, that, that in the afternoon, take the test, and you need like a seventy percent or somewhere. I think it varies uh, basically. That's kind of the hardest part uh, is passing the test, and then you have to have relevant work experience. There's some sort of number of hours that you need to be in the financial services business to to I think it's like amounts to like three years or so, and it doesn't have to be in it as an advisor. It can just be in in the the industry. <coughs> And then you have to demonstrate professional ethics, which you know everybody has to do in, in the industry, so it's just a kind of part of the deal. The other thing about it is there's a fiduciary standard, which just basically means that you have to act solely in the client's best interest when offering personalized financial advice. So you, you know, depending on, I'll get to how you know, commission-based versus fee-based, there's kind of two different ways that financial advisors generally get paid. Um, I'll, I'll get into that uh, more, more later, but basically just you can't just recommend a product, and it can't just be uh, suitable at the time. If you're a CFP, they say it has to, you have to stay with that client and, and make sure that their entire thing is suitable throughout your relationship with them. So what are different types of investment accounts? Uh, and this isn't anything specific to what we do. It's just kind of in general. These are kind of the, the things that you'll see. So obviously, you got your employer plans. You got 401ks. Uh, Roth 401ks, 403bs, for, uh, and 457s. So 401ks, probably most people know what that is. It's if you work for a profit, a profit organization, for-profit organization, generally they'll have some sort of match. So you put in 5% of your income and they'll match you know, half of that, 2.5% will go into an account and then it grows. And a lot of the, the traditional 401k, just like the traditional IRA and other things, they're pre-tax. So if you put it in, you don't pay tax on, on the income, but then it grows tax-free, but when you take it out, then you have to pay tax on it. 
The Roth version of that is slightly different. Uh, basically, it's if you put in money that's already been taxed, so it's post-tax money, but it gets to grow tax-free, and when you take it out, it's tax-free. There's some rules of when you can take it out and all that. You can there, There's more specifics, but in general, that, that's just kind of how they work. Most of you probably know this kind of stuff, but just going over it. Same, same kind of deal with the 403B, except for that's for nonprofit organizations. Uh, you know, usually schools or hospitals will have the 403B. And then the 457 is for like government employees. I think they're called thrift savings plans as, as well. If you're self-employed and you know you don't have access to a 401k through a company, uh, there's a few different plans you can do. They're SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, and solo 401ks. And again, they all have very different specific rules as to how much can be contributed into them. It kind of depends on how many employees you have and how much how much income you think you're going to make. It might be the best option. So there's specifics with those. But again, they go in their pre-tax money, and then when you take them out, you know they're, you, you get taxed, but you get that tax deduction on the way in. Solo 401ks are, are a little bit newer. Those are if you're just self-employed. It kind of acts basically like a, a, a traditional or employer 401k plan, but you can you can get it for yourself if, if only you are the employee. The SEP and the simple are if you have other employees, because then they have rules on you have to contribute X amount of dollars for your employees as well as yourself. Uh, and then there's the basic retirement accounts, traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs, kind of the same thing. There's contribution limits. You know, they're, I think they're if you're over 50 years old for a traditional IRA, you can put in $7,000 in one year. And again, there's there's other caveats to that, but that, that's kind of the general rule. If you're under 50 years old, you can put in 6,000. We also deal, or you can also deal with 529 plans, college savings plans. You know, those uh, again, in general, the basic idea is you can put in money. Uh, it can grow tax deferred, uh, and then when you take it out, as long as it's used for uh, the child's education, uh, you can um, take that out tax free as well. So you, you get the growth tax free uh, as well as the, the, all the other things. And then there's the after tax accounts where you know it's just basic. You have a, an account in your name or a joint account with a spouse or, or a trust <coughs> account, something like that. And you know the, the basic savings accounts not specifically for retirement, and those don't have all those different you know contribution limits and, and things like that. What type of in just general what type of investment products are, are out there? Obviously, most most of you probably know all this, but there's you know stocks, buying stock in a company, Microsoft, Amazon, whatever it is. Uh, bonds, so you, basically they, they issue debt, so you buy a bond, they pay you interest, and then at the end of the time frame, they, they pay you back your lump sum, hopefully, uh, depending. There's obviously a risk, different levels of risk where a bond, if you have like a treasury where it's the government, there's very low risk, or if you have a, a company that isn't rated as well, they'll pay you a higher interest rate, but there's a chance that you wouldn't get all of your investment back because they're, they're uh, riskier. Uh, mutual funds, you know, again, just uh, basically just a pool of stocks, or it can be stocks and bonds, depending on kind of your risk tolerance. If you can have a mutual fund that is very risky, that's invested in, you know, aggressive stocks, or you can have one, a mutual fund that's very conservative, that you know, invests in treasury bonds. So it just kind of depends on your risk tolerance there. Uh, ETFs, uh, again, they're they're similar to mutual funds. They're a basket of stocks. Um, they're they're traded a little bit differently. Um, there's different, you know, tax efficiencies or different things that you can do with ETFs. Again, if you want to get into the details, but they're similar to mutual funds um, as far as they're just a basket of, of stocks. Annuities, you can have a whole, a whole hour-long discussion about annuities, and there's variable annuities that invest in different mutual funds, and they have all these different living benefits or income benefits that are that you can kind of get like a pension type thing uh, out of them. Or you can have like a fixed annuity that just says we're going to pay you a three percent rate over the next seven years. A lot of things. A lot of times they have, you know, they'll, they're locking up your money. That's that's how they can guarantee. They give you these guarantees that you're going to get this rate, but you can't withdraw the money or you'd be penalized in a certain <coughs> amount of time. So just different fees associated with that. REITs are real 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 estate investment trusts. The, you know, you don't see a ton of those, but basically you're investing in physical real estate. And a company kind of chooses, you know, the real estate that that you're investing in, and then you get dividends, or you kind of get like basically you just get rent payments from that. So it's another thing, kind of like a bond, where you give them a lump sum and they pay you interest uh, on that based on basically usually it's just rent payments or mortgage payments from the, whatever real estate they invest in. So commission-based versus fee-based, basically that's just how the the fees. You know, everybody's always worried about investment fees as they should. 
And so that's how generally those are the two ways that financial advisors get paid or, or money managers get paid. Commission based can be you know any type of thing. We would usually let's say for mutual funds you would pay some sort of upfront fee to get in that, and then there'd be a, an annual uh, fee going forward. Um, where fee based that that's usually made up of it's basically they call it like in the, a lot of times it's an advisory fee where you, you're going to hire a financial advisor and you want you're paying for their advice you're not necessarily paying for just the investment products so that's kind of an all all encompassing. Uh, sort of thing. So it just depends on, on your situation. There's no good or bad necessarily way to do it. You just have to have the conversation and, and make sure that you look at what each one would cost and then you can make your decision on what, what you want to do based on how much they cost. There's also information on, you know, if, I don't know if you, anybody hears active management versus passive uh, management. So uh, active management, let's say you have a mutual fund and basically what you're doing is you're paying some sort of investment company and they have researchers or fund managers that they invest, they, they look through all the different companies that they want to invest in, and they're the ones buying and selling the stocks. They're the, they're the stock pickers. They're picking what, what, what you should invest in based on that mutual funds. If it's a large cap growth fund, like biggest companies, you know, they're, they're the, they have a specific amount, or a, I guess a if it's a large cap growth fund, they can only invest in large companies. If there's a small cap growth fund, they can only invest in small. They, they can't, you know, switch. If they think the stock market is going down, they can't, oh, now we, now we want to invest in bonds. They can't do that. They have to stick with whatever their fund is um, with the, within those parameters. So they're the ones picking, uh, picking that. Passive is indexing, basically. So if you hear of like the Dow Jones Industrial Average or the S&P 500, it's just an index based on like the S&P 500 is the 500 biggest companies in America and it's, it's weighted for market cap. So the biggest companies are the biggest portion of that index. So if you invest in a, in a usually it's an ETF um, that you just invest in the S&P 500 and it's just based, there's nobody buying and selling based on what they think, no research. It's just whatever that index is, those are the stocks they buy in the percentages that that index uh, is currently at. So there's, you know, that you don't have to pay an active manager to do that. It's it's cheaper uh, in, in, in that regard. So, and as far as performance on those two, passive has done better recently. Uh, you can look at long-term trends, and active, you know, has sometimes outperformed. Uh, it just depends on on time frames, uh, essentially, and, and how you're looking at it. Um, usually the the general rules they think active managers probably perform better in a down market because they're they're actually switching or they they're doing research that that remains to be seen because the act, passive management has actually done better uh, in the last you know over the the last ten years when the stock market's going up part of that's because the the bigger companies are the bigger performers the Apple and the Microsoft and the, the Amazon uh, those companies are have been the best performers over the ten years and those are the highest weighted in the in the indexes so if you happen to have that. And that those have been doing the best. Is that going to continue forever? Probably not, but but you don't know. So it'll be interesting to see in the next kind of bear market, as you would say, in the next downturn, if these active managers uh, can can make up for that the, and, and and outperform some of these passive funds. So that was all I really had. Uh, any questions? How is it working for Mike Hunter? <laughs> <laughs> Does he look happy? He does. <laughs> I tried to fool my mom too. <laughs> You'd have to ask Mike Hunter. Uh, John's John's been a it's a good um, it's a good mix for us. You know, I, uh, there's um, the more seasoned you get at this profession, sometimes you get um, I don't know I, I I wouldn't say you get a little bit of an edge to you know you get a little bit of goose leather um, for John to come in and he, he does a great job, very proficient, very um, task oriented. Um, whereas I'm more of a procrastinator, so he kind of that's good. Um, you know, when you have more experience dealing with people, sometimes there's a there's a little help for John on that. But we, we work well together. It's a business that's um, John kind of followed through on it, but it's it's a it can be a tough business. You know how it is when you're dealing with people sharp. It can it can be the best part of your business and the worst part of your business, and you've probably got 80 or 90 percent of your clients are great to work with. But you spend most of your time with those other 10 or 20 percent. That's about how it goes, you know. But it's an interesting because the, the dynamics in the business is constantly changing, you know, with markets and also with laws. 
So we have to do continuing taxes. education. All you know, you're, you're required for, for those licenses. You have to do yeah. a certain 24 hours of continuing education. Same with the CFP. They have their own continuing education, so you have yeah. to keep up on all that kind of stuff, which is good. I think there'll be a need there. You know, how they've kind of commoditized the investments with the ETFs or they've made it easier for people to invest on their own, whether you want to do it like uh, it doesn't cost you any money to do a trade at Schwab anymore, you know, or you can do your own things online. You know, at first I thought that would be the death knell of our business, but um, I think there's still some there's still some reason to get advice out there, I think. And so that's what you do. So, John, you know, if some um, some advisors sell for Prudential or Edward Jones, or so do you have, like, a cafe of companies, or do you represent yeah, so, a certain? Yep, so we're an independent broker dealer, so we can sell basically anything. Um, we, of course, we, we have to narrow that down. We can't, you know, know everything about all these different companies. So we do have a specific, a certain amount of mutual fund companies that we kind of are go-tos, and same thing with annuities. If we decide we want to do that, we do, but but part of the, the benefit of being independent is that you do have, you don't, you're not just like a prudential rep or you're not just a, a specific rep. So we can do that, but you know, as everything else, you can't just, oh yeah, I do everything. Well, we have to, because we have to be more experts on, on certain things. So we do narrow it down, but, but we do have the option of, of doing uh, various things. So if someone is without their advisor, they've either just walked away or moved or whatever, mm -hmm. and you just come and see people like you or Jeremy and yep. say, what would you do here? And right. And a lot of times, you know, you, you can continue to do what they what they have, or if you have, you know, you just want to tweak certain things, you can do that, or you can just fully change everything. It's just kind of up to, and then you have to go through again with the fees and how that would all, all what what the costs are of all that, and go through it. But yeah, usually you can you can do all that kind of stuff. Is that what varies the, the fees that like me as an individual would pay? Because I have friends in other communities. And every time they go to see their financial advisor, it's a certain percentage they have to pay them, whereas the gentleman I work with works for a specific group. Mm -hmm. But he does, is it something you choose to do? And he doesn't charge me every time I call him or right. do it's, anything. Yeah, it's kind of how you set up, how your business is set up. And if, if they're you know, charge like a certain percentage, it's probably fee based. I don't obviously I don't know, but they say, okay, we're gonna charge you one percent of your assets, you know, and, and that relationship and then it'll come out quarterly. So you'll you'll see that that come out quarterly. You'll just see what your fee is where if you're not like a lot of the commission based things, if you pay it up front, you don't see fees coming out. There still are some underlying fees, um, but they are usually a little bit less than than, than the, the the fee base, but you won't see those fees come out. It's just part of the investment product. So if sometimes if you're paid through the investment product you generally don't see a lot of those fees, which they're trying to get more transparent, I think, and I, they, I think eventually they're gonna be completely like, this is what you're paying, and we that's what we do now. We just say, you're not gonna see this, but this is what you're paying. You know? right. So you have to, have to do so a good I think that's that. the, what that, I'm seeing is the one that's more, you know. Yeah. The other one that's right up front says so you have to pay a certain percentage. Yep, exactly. So you'll see those deducted where if it's a commission not, product, that comes free. Yep, it's not free. So if, if you're, if you're Person's telling you it's free, they're probably lying. So you have to. <laughs> <laughs> and that was one thing when I, before I retired, I was told to go to a couple sessions to talk about the uh, Wisconsin retirement. Mm -hmm. And that was an eye opener for me because that's a huge group and they invest and, you know, we did reports all along, but <clears throat> some of what you told makes sense, more sense now. Sure. Yeah, to understand what they're doing with their retirement money. Right. Yeah, and the pensions are obviously a different different thing. Those are we don't you know do pensions. Um, so that's usually the employer or you know or like. Well, one of them is called the employee trust fund. Right. So that. that yes. Yeah. So pensions are kind of going away as far as employee. They're not really. You know, I'll I'll never see a pension. You know, it's going to all be have to be my own four hundred and one k that kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. Very few of those around. John and I go round and round about you know it must be in different generations you know he's constantly bashing the uh, the baby boomers and I constantly bash. <laughs> it's all in good fun. Yeah, yeah. It's all in good fun. Yeah. but it's it's definitely different. Yeah. That's a, it's a good working relationship. I, I think you know just with my experience and not that I haven't been around for a while. I've been in financial service for 12 years, but there's still a lot of experience that Mike gives me. And then there's a lot of things that I've learned just from my different companies and my, you know, tech, technology. I'm not great, but you know, I've still had more experience in that, that area than Mike. So I think it's just been, it's been a good, good partnership and just, it's a good way to do it. Yeah. Well, personally, I have to say, I'm so glad there's people like you around so that you could know more work in my medical profession than I put in your financial. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank heavens we've all got different strengths. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.